What's up? So we're going to talk about a brief overview today about eschatology. Eschatology is the study of last things, like it says right here. And the reason I'm going to do this, just a brief overview, I'm not going to go into detail about uh, the individual viewpoints. Um, it's just going to be an overview, and maybe in the future I'll do more in-depth study of this stuff. But the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to be talking about the rapture soon. I'm going to be doing some shows on that. And uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to do an overview of the major um, eschatological positions out there because, um, to be honest, a lot of people are ignorant about really, you know, what the positions are that have been held throughout history or what positions are held outside of their churches. A lot of people just grow up in a church or they just go to the church and all they know is what they believe. And uh, most of the time that's premillennialism. Uh, and that's all they know. And it's because that's what's popular. And they don't understand that there's all these other viewpoints that have been held throughout church history that are held today. And uh, it's a very good idea to understand these um, to better understand where your position is and also to be able to better um, argue against someone else's position. Uh, and to prove what is correct from the Bible, okay? So we're just going to jump right into it and uh, start an overview of this. And uh, so, first of all, we're going to look at some umbrella terms here. So the three umbrella terms I have up here are preterism, historicism, and futurism. Okay, so the first one, preterism. Preterism teaches that most all of the major prophecies of the Bible, especially in Revelation, have already been fulfilled in the past. Um, basically, if you're a full preterist, they believe that by 70 AD, all the major prophecies in the Bible have been fulfilled, including the second coming, the millennium, everything. It's all fulfilled. Uh, they believe that people like Antiochus of Epiphanes was the Antichrist, and just there's nothing left to be fulfilled. Uh, so you see here that there's full and there's partial preterists. So some people don't believe everything has been fulfilled. Some are partial. Uh, and then also what I have here in parentheses is it says Catholic and Protestant. And the reason I have these parentheses and I have them in the other categories too is that historically these are the people who believe these positions. So preterism was first mostly believed by Catholics. And then slowly it was accepted by some Protestants. Um, there was a Protestant who tried to popularize it. Uh, Protestants were slow to accept it, but then eventually more Protestants began to accept it. But it's historically been a Catholic position. Now, I'm not going to be giving a lot of commentary on this, okay? It's mostly just, excuse me, it's mostly just going to be an overview. I'm not going to say which one's right or, or any of those types of things. I Actually, that's not true. I, I am going to show you some danger in some of these. Um, you know, the danger of this one would be uh, a faulty interpretation of Scripture. Um, first of all, if you believe all the prophecies have already been fulfilled, you have some major error in your uh, interpretation of the Scriptures. And um, before I go any further as well, Please, go back and watch my teaching, How to Read, Study, and Interpret the Bible. Because that's very important when it comes to studying any doctrine. It doesn't matter if we're studying eschatology, we're studying Christology, pneumatology, it doesn't matter what it is. You need to make sure that you're interpreting the Bible properly, in context, all these types of things. Otherwise, you're just going to come up with some wacky idea. Um, you know, the reality is, is most people's eschatology or any type of theology, they believe it just because that's what their family believes or their church has taught and they just go along with it and they never question it and they never study it out for themselves. So that's if that's one thing you get out of this is that you need to study the Bible for yourself. You need to come to a position on your eschatology. Okay? Now, so there's the danger of uh, faulty interpretation. There's also the danger of if you believe everything's already been fulfilled, um, then you're not going to be expecting any of the prophecies that are going to be coming to pass in the future or going on right now. And uh, you're also at a disadvantage when it comes to witnessing to people because you can't tell them, look, this is prophecy that is being fulfilled right now or, you know, is going to be fulfilled in the soon future. So that some of the dangers there. 
All right, so let's move on to the next one, historicism. Historicism um, was it the, the that was the most popular position for Protestants. Uh, many Baptists believe it, and also many Seventh Day Adventists believe that. Now, just because like just because I list someone believed it, that doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just to show you who historically who believed it. Okay. Now, historicism means that the prophecies in the Bible regarding the end times have been fulfilled in the past. They're being fulfilled now in the present, and they will be. There's some to be fulfilled in the future as well. And the the biggest marker and distinction of historicism in, was the fact that they pointed to the papacy as the Antichrist. Um, the Protestants were historicists, so they said, "Hey, look at this. These popes right here. This pope, he fulfills." All the criteria for who the Antichrist would be, that's the Antichrist right now. Okay, so it's not in the past. It already happened. It's not a man of sin that's going to appear in the future. He's there right now. And that's what they taught. Um, so the historicism, like I said, predominantly Protestant, that's what they taught. And it's, you know, there's, there's some overlap with these. Some can be partial historicists, partial futurists. So there is some overlap, but historicism is generally what they believed. Uh, the danger of that, again, is kind of a little bit of the danger of the predatorism. If you say it's, especially for the people that say it's only historicism, and that it's only the popes uh, of the past, and that there's no future man of sin, you get into some danger there. Um, but they have very strong evidence for historicism and their uh, evidence in the scriptures, okay? Now let's go on to the next one, which is futurism, okay? We're going to focus a little bit more time on that, and this is where you find a lot of um, the eschatologies that we find today. So under futurism, we would include amillennialism, postmillennialism, and premillennialism. Um, amillennialism, I guess, you know, it still is technically, I guess you could consider under futurism, but if you notice, first of all, what word do you see that repeats in all these words? Millennial, millennial. And we're not talking about people that eat Tide Pods, okay? Um, we're talking about the millennium, okay? The thousand year reign of Christ, which the Bible teaches in the book of Revelation, Revelation 20. Um, so a millennial means without a millennium. You know, like an atheist means without God. Um, a lot of amillennialists don't really like that term. Amillennial, they use another term, think it's like nunk millennial or something like that. But anyways, amillennial means that they don't believe the thousand year reign of Christ, the millennium, is a literal thousand years. They just believe that the thousand years is symbolic of a long period of time and it can be used synonymously with the church age. So as soon as Christ was was died, he was buried, and he was resurrected, the start of the church age, and that's when their millennium started, was which is just this long church age period. But they do believe that there will be a second coming of Christ at the end of this period, whenever that is. So there is some futurism in there. That's why it's under futurism. Traditionally and historically, this was the Catholic position. Very strongly, a Catholic position was on millennialism. All right, let's move on to the next one, postmillennialism. Now, this one is very interesting. I have quite a bit to say about that, and it is gaining a lot of popularity today. Postmillennialism was believed by quite a bit of Puritans, and now it is also believed by new Reformed guys like uh, Jeff Durbin, Apologia Church, those type of people. What postmillennial means is that. Christ will return, not before the millennial reign, but after. And their definition of the millennial reign is now the Christians are establishing the kingdom of God on earth through their preaching and teaching, and that the world will actually, instead of get worse and worse, which is what a lot of Christians believe, they believe it will get better and better. And that a lot of people in the world, most of the world will get saved, and then at the end of that, Christ will return. Sort of, we deliver up the kingdom to Christ and say, look, we have taken dominion of the earth for you. Here is the kingdom. 
Um, this is what post-millennialists believe. Now, the danger in this, and I'm going to be teaching more about this in the future, is that there's a, quite a few things. Obviously, interpretation. Well, you know, let's go back to amillennialism. What's the danger of amillennialism? Very dangerous as far as interpretation. I mean, they make everything symbolic. The tribulation, the rapture, the second coming, the millennial reign, the resurrection of the dead, all symbolic. And if that's your how you interpret the Bible when it comes to eschatology, what are you doing with the rest of the Bible? That's what I'd say. Danger of amillennialism is. But also post-millennial, same thing. But also, here's the bigger danger with post-millennialism. Post-millennialists uh, are often strong advocates of theocracies. They have no problem merging church and state, which is a big problem. Um, historically speaking, whenever you merge church and state, people die. Persecution results. And his, in, in history, we see that the, the first people to merge church and state were the Catholic Church. You know, it's kind of started with Con Emperor Constantine in the Roman Empire. And then eventually, around 600 AD, when the Catholic Church fully formed, we see a real merging of church and state. And what happened? Persecutions, inquisitions, crusades. Many people were, were killed and they were persecuted. You were not allowed to have a church unless you were as a Catholic church. You were not allowed to have your own Bible. You were not allowed to believe whatever you believed. You were not allowed to preach anything. And if you were found out to be a heretic, you were persecuted, you were tortured, you were killed. That's a result of a church and state union. Then, once the Protestants got power, after the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, the printing press was invented, and they were printing Bibles, they broke the Catholic Church's power over Europe, and then Protestants start to get power. Now you think that would be a good thing, but unfortunately in a lot of cases it was a bad thing. In some, place, in some ways it was a very good thing. They gave us the King James Bible. They broke the Catholic Church's power in Europe and, and brought uh, a lot of Protestants came to America and, and helped to establish freedom of religion. Problem is, when Protestants came to America, they started their own theocracy and they merged church and state. And if you didn't have permission from the Protestants, the state church there, to have a church, you would also be persecuted. And one example I could give is a man by the name of Obadiah Holmes. He was involved in an unauthorized church assembly. What happened to him? He was publicly whipped because he wouldn't pay a fine. Other people like Roger Williams were exiled. They had to go down to Rhode Island. They were kicked out of Massachusetts. If you didn't pay a, a a tithe to the state church, you can get in trouble. You could have your property confiscated. You could be you could be hurt. Uh, Zwingli, for instance, one of the Protestant reformers, he drowned Baptists, Anabaptists. Um, so a lot of death and persecution resulted from the Protestants merging the church and state. So whenever you have a merging of church and state, there's a lot of trouble that happens after that. Some Protestants might be mad at that. They say, how can you say that against the great Protestant reformers? Sorry, that's history. That's exactly what happened. And that shows you the danger of church and state. Now, the Baptists are the ones... Now, I have another video. Let me stop you. I have a video called Why I'm Not an Independent Fundamental Baptist, okay? The, the fundamental Baptists of today have very little in common with the Baptists in history. The Anabaptists, the historic Baptists in America, they have very little in common with what they believe. But the point is, you can go check history. John Leland was a Baptist preacher in Orange County, Virginia, and he told James Madison, if you don't put a Bill of Rights in the Constitution that says we have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, uh, freedom to assemble, this whole county is not going to vote for you. And so they put that in there. The Bill of Rights was put in the Constitution because of pressure of the Baptists, because they knew if they didn't put that in there, that Protestants could get power and they could have their speech, freedom of speech taken away, the freedom of religion, the freedom to assemble in a church, they could be all taken away and they could be persecuted unless those rights were guaranteed. So the Baptists are one that put that in there. The Baptists supported separation of church and state. And I find it funny today that a lot of Christian leaders, conservative leaders, talk against separation of church and state as if it's a bad thing. Oh, that's like an atheist thing. No, that's a good thing. Separation of church and state protects 
not only the the government from controlling churches, but it also protects a certain denomination, certain church from taking control of the government and telling everyone else, you believe what we believe or you're going to be in trouble. And I find it very troubling that some of these post-millennial new reform guys are actually talking about that it would be good if the Protestants took control of the government and it's instituted things like blasphemy laws. That can only result in persecution. And it's not biblical whatsoever. So the, the post-millennial belief is an eschatology that does have a real-world danger and consequence to it. All right, now let's move on to premillennialism. Premillennialism. This is the one that would be we'd find the most popular eschatologies underneath. Okay, premillennialism, historically Protestant and Baptist belief. You could say it goes all the way back to the apostles. Uh, a very Predominant belief, premillennialism. What does that mean? It means Christ will return before the millennium. When Christ returns, he will establish his earthly millennial thousand year kingdom. And then after the end of that kingdom, there will be the final judgment and a new heaven and a new earth and all these other types of things that are talked in Revelation 20. Okay, so that's premillennial. Now, under premillennial, premillennialism, if you didn't know, can be found three different, uh, multiple different views of the rapture. Pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture are all under the category of pre-millennialism because they all believe Christ will return and on earth and then establish a millennial reign. The only way that they differ is if Christ will return at the beginning of the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation, in the middle or the end, and then the millennial reign comes. But yeah, and all of them believe he will come at some point before the millennial reign. Okay? Now, the pre-tribulation rapture a lot of, is the most popular view in the world. It was first, it was historically believed by Protestants and Baptists, and it was, uh, it is the it's the, the view of dispensationalists. Okay, so disp we're not going to get into this, but we'll get into it later in another teaching. Dispensationalism is the, the systematic theology that was invented a little bit before Darby, but Darby made it popular. He systematized it, and then Schofield really popularized it in the notes of his Schofield Bible, which Jack Hiles got a hold of. He used that. That made it popular among the Baptists, fundamental Baptists. And this theology of the preacher of rapture and dispensationalism be made, was made even way more famous through the Left Behind books written by Tim LaHaye. And some also some really awful movies. So, and then also a Nicolas Cage movie. All right, so the Left Behind series... Made that really popular. So the preacher of rapture is the most popular position all throughout the world. Kind of makes you question, why is it so popular? And then there would be the mid-tribulation rapture, which says Jesus comes back three and a half years into the seven-year tribulation. And then the post-tribulation rapture, he returns at the end of the seven-year tribulation or, you know, pretty close to the end, the seventh trumpet, whatever. Different, there's different variations. But that pretty much covers that, okay? Now, here's the thing. We have people that are post-trib and pre-trib arguing with each other and calling each other heretics when they all believe in a physical, literal, bodily return of the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe he's, they believe he's uh, God manifest in the flesh. They believe all the fundamental doctrines of the faith. They believe in all the orthodox doctrines about Jesus. Under premillennialism, yet they're at each other's throats because they disagree about when he returns either before, during, or after the tribulation. I think that's a big problem. There's no reason to be at each other's throats when it comes to the timing of when he returns in regards to the tribulation. If you're, if you're all premillennial, you're, you're orthodox. You have a pretty solid method of interpretation of the Bible. But if you're post-millennial, you get into some pretty bad consequences. If you're amillennial, 
your interpretation of scripture is really symbolic, uh, figurative. There's a lot of danger there. Okay, so I'm showing you this in this larger context, making this point about premillennialists arguing with each other. Calling It's okay to disagree, obviously, but to call each other heretics or even lost, some people say, you believe in a different God if you have a different position on the rapture. It's it's pretty ridiculous. Okay? So that that about covers the main, you know, I'm sure there's some other views out there. Everybody comes up with weird views. These are the main eschatological positions. And then one last point is under here. I've listed under eschatology, the main topics that would fall under eschatology would be death and the afterlife, the tribulation period, the rapture, the second coming, the resurrection of the dead, the millennial, the millennium, the end of the world and the last judgment, and the new heaven and the new earth. Those would all be topics that would fall under eschatology. Okay? Now, if you were to study another subject, let's say Christology, you would you would have under the Christology the humanity of Christ, the deity of Christ, you know, the death of Christ, the virgin birth of Christ, all these types of things. I've I've done multiple videos on Christology. And um, so that you know, one last word before we end this, because this is a brief overview of, of this topic, is you know, if you're jumping around all over the place and you're studying all different types of things, you know, and you're jumping from one thing to another, and you put so much emphasis on, uh, you know, sensational things, or you only focus on one thing all the time, think about the fact of, do you have each of these subjects studied out, and do you have a position for each of these topics? that you've studied out yourself in the scriptures and you can prove with scriptures under eschatology? Do you have a position on death in the afterlife, tribulation, rapture, second coming, resurrection of the dead, millennium, and the world last judgment? Do you have a new earth? Do you have a position on the deed of Christ, the, the virgin birth, the uh, death of Christ, the virgin birth? Can you have scriptures proving all those? What about pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit? Do you, can, you, can, you tell, can you tell us if the Holy Spirit is a person, if the Holy Spirit is God? And disprove that the Holy Spirit is, is an, just a force, right? Theology, what's your view of God? God the Father, what about the Trinity? What about the study of, of um, Bibliology? What do you believe about inspiration of Scripture, preservation of Scripture? All these other types of things. See, people jump around all over the place. And they want to know the latest thing. And, and they want to know about this thing and that thing and this thing going on in the news and this guy and that guy and this false teacher. Yet you don't even have these basics down. It's time you sat down in a systematic way, study the Bible, and find out where you stand on each of these positions. And you'll grow in your faith. It'll strengthen your faith, your ability to understand the scriptures and ability to communicate it and to teach it. You'll be a better witness. You know, if you go to witness to someone and they ask you about any one of these topics, you should have an answer because you're the one that's the Christian. You're the one that's supposed to be reading the Bible. And they don't need to hear, you know, about some random thing that you've been, you've been looking at, about some, some crazy topic. And, 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 and you're sitting here studying things about like the Nephilim all the time or giants or some, you know, you're, you're look, talking about charismatics all the time or, or, you know, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Any topic that you just over and over and over again. Where do you stand? Have you studied it? Okay? And also, do you have the right attitude in discussing and saying, you know what? These guys in premillennial, they're not so bad compared to preterism and postmillennialism and amillennialism. They're not so bad. Historicists, they're not that bad. You know? You have to understand everything in context. Okay? So that's just a brief overview. I'd love to go into more detail in the future, especially about historicism, post-millennialism. We'll definitely study more about that in the future. But for now, why don't you go study some of these things? Study these categories. Study the history of them. We know there's Jesuit involvement in preterism and futurism. Just because a Jesuit was involved in futurism doesn't mean that's false. Even though Jesuits are very evil and wicked, they're very cunning. And they like to take every position so that no matter what 
they are right and they sow seeds of confusion okay so um yeah that's about that and, and, and also study all of these topics find out where you stand and do you have multiple scriptures proving your position can you teach it okay so that's it for today and uh you know i'll be having videos coming up soon about the rapture okay is it pre mid or post i will tell you what i believe the scriptures teaches thank you have a good day